Semper Vivi here with you for the next hour talking about professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, SportsByline.com, over-the-air affiliates, podcast, replays on Sirius XM, video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However you're joining me today, I'd just like to say thank you. Hopefully, wherever you are, it's sunny outside. If not, hopefully it's sunny inside your mind. Starting to get overcast where I'm at here, but I don't care. We had like three perfect spring days in a row, so I cannot complain whatsoever. Unlike my wife, who is, complains all the time this time of year because one of her favorite shows, The Young and the Restless, is about to be preempted due to the NCAA men's basketball tournament. And that same college basketball tournament is going to cause a preemption for AEW collision. This is from a story posted up to the main page of the Wrestling Observer newsletter or WrestlingObserver.com by Josh Nason today. There will be no collision on Saturday, March 23rd due to the tournament. Early in February, it was reported that the Wednesday, March 20th edition of AEW Dynamite, this coming Wednesday from Toronto, is going to be followed by a live edition of Rampage due to NCAA commitments from the network on Friday. Both shows will air on TBS. Uh, starting this Saturday, AEW is beginning a four-show Canadian tour that will see them visit Ottawa, Toronto, Quebec City, and London over the next two weeks. The last time that collision was preempted was last month due to the NBA All-Star Weekend. That followed preemptions in for Saturday's pay-per-views in November for Full Gear and December for World's End. So AEW's schedule uh, indicates a return to TV normalcy after next week, but the next shift comes on Saturday, April 20th, when they will air Collision, followed by a live Rampage. It is unclear why the, why the Friday, April 19th Rampage is being preempted, but it is likely due to the NBA or NHL playoffs being aired on there. So a lot to get into today. We got a little bit of return to normalcy on this show. As Filthy Tom Lawler is back, it is a Filthy Friday. He's taking a break from mashing faces into the mat and breaking bones and embarrassing Satoshi Kojima during title ceremonies. Going to get his thoughts on a lot of things, including, yeah, I'm doing it to you again, the breakup of the AEW Continental Crown. We're going to let Filthy put a big exclamation point on the end of that uh, and maybe make fun of Brian and I. We'll find out. We'll be back Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper Vivi here with you and Filthy Tom Waller, too. You know, we do this show right here for an hour at a time, but if you want us 24 7, you can try to find us on Twitter slash X. I am at Semper Vivi. Filthy is at Filthy Tom Lawler. The website is at W O N F 4 W. And the broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. Jim Valley and Andrew Zarian are what their names are on Twitter. And Jim is here with you on Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. And Andrew Zarian is here with you on Sundays starting at 6 p.m. Pacific, or 6 p.m. Eastern Time. You know, I'm terrible with these plugs today, Filthy. You know, I'm not even going to I'm not even gonna tell everybody about the Wrestling News. They should know about that already. At Wrestling News AV on Facebook and Twitter, thewrestlingnews.com. Find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. But without any other further ado... Our champion, MLW World Tag Team Champion, Filthy Tom Lawler has rejoined the show after several weeks away. We have we've been missing you on Filthy. I've been missing you on Fridays, Tom. And what better Friday for you to come back? It is the Ides of March, the Saint Ides of March. Welcome back. Thank you for that grand introduction. <laughs> the People's Champion, the Man of the Peephole. Filthy People. Tom Waller. Yes, back in action. One half of the world's toughest tag team. I dare you, Mike. I dare you, Mike Sempervivi, to find yes, two guys in the pro wrestling ranks who could beat up me and Harry Smith. Two on two. I don't think you're going to find them. Not going to be many out there who I put my money on. Now, no. look. You've had a lot going on here recently, and, and your April seems to be lining up quite nicely here. I saw the Deadlock Show, Captain's Fall, six-man tag team match coming up in, in Durham, North Carolina. You and the West Coast Wrecking Crew, which 
you guys seem to be back on the same page here a little bit. I, I don't know. Am I? Is everything good in, in the land of Team Filthy? We talk things out a little bit. You know, sometimes these matches get signed. The contracts are inked before some stuff goes down. But we've worked it out in the interim. And we were victorious this past weekend. And we will be victorious once again in the captain's fall elimination. I've been trying to get rid of Dom Garini and Kevin Koo for years now, ever since I gave them the boot out of Team Filthy. And I'm finally going to do it once and for all. And LeBron Cazon, he's going back to the KO zone once again in this match. Team Filthy will walk out victorious. You cannot lose to a man named LeBron Calzone. You can't, you can't do it. You cannot do this, Tom. You need to be ready for this. You cannot lose to LeBron Calzone. You can't. And I did notice, too, do, can you break any news here on this show about what your plans are going to be on WrestleMania weekend? Because I saw that you have now been added to the action wrestling show taking place in nearby Williamstown, New Jersey, Dean... Tilda bang, three exclamation points. But what's up with that? You gonna you gonna be doing anything else uh, around that time? I mean, I'm going to be in town. That is the only show that I am scheduled to perform at. However, I'll be attending the Stardom show. Of course, I can't miss that on U.S. soil, but. If you want to see me wrestle, you'll have to watch Dean. I am an old member of the Death Valley Driver video review message board from way back in the day. And uh, I'm happy to be on that show. Got a lot of your Japanese education through the compilations that would come out through there for many years. Actually, you know where, where I benefited from them was Lucha big time was from lucha because that was something that i would watch and still watch and and enjoy watching but i have as far as going back into history and and knowing a lot of the people and knowing what matches to watch i mean that was really and still is an invaluable resource so that is cool that they're putting on a, that show for him and in honor of him so i have a feeling that you're going to have more planned for that weekend i think you're being coy about this right now but we'll, we'll see what happens here are you going to be now a a regular ring of honor watcher now that you know that mina shirakawa is going to be making an appearance what do you think about this whole split with uh with stardom and and mina looking like she's going to be sticking with stardom and she's going to end up in windy city for in chicago as well too do you want to see more mina in america I think a lot of fans want to see more Mina in America. She is one of the most improved wrestlers over the past few years, I would say. Her overall presentation has really been upped ever since, you know, around the time of the pandemic. Uh, since she had that jaw injury, right? She got her face, she got her face smashed in by Saya Kamatani. Yes. If I remember correctly. And uh, ever since she came back from that, she's really been in top form. So glad to see her on U.S. soil. It was a surprise, you know. Uh, she wasn't advertised previously. And to me, I think, you know, that's a, someone that you want to advertise in advance because she has a lot of star quality. Now watch this transition. Somebody that she had a great match with was Julia. And Julia will be on her way to WWE very soon. She's not there right now, but you know who is? The Rock. <laughs> and once again, <laughs> The Rock. Well, Go ahead. Julia, uh, I saw, was actually just taken off of this weekend's stardom shows. Yes. Due, due to illness. So uh, was this set to be her last appearance? I no, because she's still got some more to go, and I think she we're has, still going to get the match with with Tam at some point. Yeah. We're going to get a tag match with them together, and then probably one singles match between the two. That'll probably end her time there. That's what it. it, it that's what it, it seems like, at least, unless politics get in the way of that. Well, clearly, it doesn't seem as if she's long for 
stardom, although stranger things have happened. True, true, but uh, like I don't think... The Rock coming back <laughs> and not going through with the previously for years planned main event with Roman Reigns and instead shifting to what we have now. How do you like that segue, Mike? Uh, very, very good. Very good. And SmackDown tonight live on Fox from the FedEx Forum in Memphis, Tennessee. The Rock will be there. He posted another social media promo today. This one was only eight minutes long. No 20-minute, 30-minute, 40-minute adventures with The Rock. Just eight minutes this time around where he reiterated that professional wrestling is relevant and popular and cool again and ratings are up because of him. He told Memphis to get ready. He, <laughs> he complimented Cody on going through puberty and uh, slapping the dog out of him on last week's show. He then played a clip of Cody crying on Raw and then went in on him with words that only Brian and Tony Khan can say on this show. Um, <laughs> he then promised to bloody him, whip him like a dog, and then take the belt that he whipped him like a dog with and turn around and hand it to his mother, Filthy. What do you think about The Rock here as Uber Heel number one re leading into WrestleMania? Well, what I think about The Rock is that he's doing the right thing. They've done a <laughs> big <out>. shift. <laughs> what? What the, what that was I, a short bump. <laughs> the music came on. I thought I had enough for you to, to hit with something. and <laughs> Well, you just shut the music off, and I thought that we were... You guys are still on. I hit the <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I hit the music by, by accident. My bad. All right, now comes the music. Now comes the music. <laughs> well, Mike, I'll tell you what I think about The Rock on SmackDown tonight when we come back right after the break here on Wrestling Observer. We wish it wasn't live. <laughs> Mike Semper Vivi, Filthy Tom Lawler. Could could they tell we were doing this show live, Tom? If they couldn't, I mean, there's no well, way we could fake that. We're not that good of actors. So. No, not at all. Let's re-rack this. Smackdown tonight, live on Fox. The Rock is going to be there. It's Memphis, Tennessee. You know he likes to sing. Uh, what have you thought about The Rock here? He seems to be bigfooting Roman Reigns, which is seemingly part of the story here. He is sucking all of the air out of the room right now because he is The Rock. What have you thought about the uh, last couple of weeks here and about all these social media promos that he's cutting away here? I think I, as you were saying, he's done, or as I was saying before the show, fell apart again, once again. He's doing the right thing, stepping aside for Cody. And it seems like he's having a ton of fun doing so. As you mentioned, he is kind of big footing Roman Reigns. When they are both in there together, he looks to be the bigger star. I mean, the guy is gigantic in stature, physical stature, in his persona. And it comes across. Now, Roman Reigns does has, have kind of like a different aura about him, more of like a sports, I guess, star, whereas The Rock is more like a movie star, you know, if I had to draw kind of a difference between the two of them. Mike, I wonder, you know, they are in Tennessee. You mentioned if The Rock's going to sing. But I'm really wondering if he took time on the way down in Tennessee to stop at the number one most visited national park in the country, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, so he can make some more jokes about maybe the Tennessee people having no teeth and smoking some more crack. <laughs> See, he was big on that in, in Arizona. Now, you were just recently in those parts. Did you see on your trip to the Grand Canyon, did you see a lot of meth labs out there in the in the desert and a, and a whole bunch of crack smokers strewn about like The Rock said about Arizona last week? I saw a huge crack, but it was made by the Colorado River. Mm. No meth houses 
<laughs> from what I saw. But hey, maybe The Rock was in a different part. Certainly not in Scottsdale. I'll tell you that much. No, There's no, me- no meth houses there. <laughs> Didn't you know where The Rock is also not going to be? It looks like Saudi Arabia. Uh, WWE scheduled to make its return to Saudi Arabia for a PLE pay-per-view premium live event it feels so weird saying that still but got to get used to it saturday may 25th dave Meltzer reported last week that while a lot of variables and factors were in play wwe obviously wanted the rock on that event Meltzer noted that there had definitely been a push to get the rock to work at least one of wwe saudi events this year but in an update in today's wrestling observer newsletter which is up for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com, Meltzer writes that Rock's movie filming schedule rules him out of the May 25th show in Saudi Arabia. What movie is that? It is The Smashing Machine, May 1st. So we are getting that now. It's not just talk. It's coming to fruition. It is The Rock playing MMA legend Mark Kerr. The Rock Seven Bucks Productions is partnering with A24 Films, the same people that put out uh, the Iron Claw Von Eric's movie as well. So, you know, we're going to get the Rock and Roman Reigns. We have to get the Rock and Roman Reigns at some point down the line here, don't we? I mean, this year, do you think that this could be something that they could push off till, till next year's WrestleMania? It seems to me that, you know, yes, The Rock can do whatever he wants at this stage of his life, be financially solvent and all that sort of stuff for generations, but it's going to be hard for me to believe that a guy's his stature is not going to be involved in some movies here, which obviously takes out the chance of him wrestling. Is it this year or never when it comes to The Rock and Roman Reigns? I think a lot of people were of that mindset up until perhaps january of this year and it seems that there was a a seismic shift obviously with the removal of Vince McMahon and now the rock being on the board of directors has a more vested interest in what's going on with the wwe and tko they have a huge opportunity for all this synergy not only with the UFC, but with all the other connections that Endeavor has in the world of entertainment. And, you know, maybe he is now planning on sticking around for a long time. You know, maybe he views, maybe he doesn't see a ceiling perhaps for what he can do in the WWE and how much money he can make. I thought that it was going to be this year or never, but my mind has now changed. If that's the case, say that he does decide that I'm going to be doing this on the board thing and paying more attention to WWE and doing more things, or at least leaving his schedule open to it. Does that, if that's the case, does that put any doubt in your mind at all on Cody Rhodes winning the title at WrestleMania? Do you think that there's even a small chance that if this story is going to continue with the rock and roman reigns that maybe cody again they they somehow is that even possible at this point for cody rhodes not to win the thing and then still come out okay with people wanting to see him continue this chase because this is not magnum ta chasing rick flair in 1986 where you can take three years and maybe make a title change later i have a feeling at some point the fans and people will turn on Cody and the story in the whole nine yards. Is there any shot in hell that they do not change the title at mania? Cody's got to win that belt. Are you he kidding me, Mike? Uh, Are you kidding to. me? I know he has I know. to, I would think so, but he's if this got story, to, but if this story, look, the, and the way the whole thing is set up, obviously it's that the rock and Cody are going to be in coots and we'll get a reveal on what was whispered. You know, on that one show where Cody gave up the title and, you know, the title shot and walked away before changing his mind again, you know, those those lines will probably be connected there. But I don't know. I don't know. Because it's like to me, I, I don't at that point, I, I, you, I'm not saying you, you slap the Stardust costume back on Cody, but I think it would be almost <laughs> impossible, you know, for people to rally for a third year in a row after you cried your mama, all this stuff and and. 
you know, can you fail again? Can you fail again and continue Please, to make it work? Please, no. <laughs> I would hope not. You, would... you could not continue to make it work. And Roman Reigns and The Rock does not need the title behind no. it. No. no you know what I mean? One thing that I, and I could be wrong, but The Rock acknowledged Roman Reigns as his tribal chief. He didn't acknowledge him as the head of the table. Did he? He did not. You know? So I think that there's still a lot, obviously, to be told in that storyline. I think if you actually take the title away, they can tell this story between the the blood-related families. The two families joined by a blood oath generations ago. They could tell this story how they want and put a real focus on their ancestry and you know with the title involved you know obviously the title kind of takes a precedent so i think maybe it'll turn out better uh for them in the long run speaking of without the title and brian and i disagree on this and i think i'm probably in the minority when it comes to the thought of carmelo hayes and trick williams I understand why people wanted it to be for the NXT title, but I think you have something with Ilya Dragunov that is also special in its own way and I think is also beneficial in its own way. And to me, Trick Williams and Mello just don't need that title. Trick needs the title at some point, unless he's going up to the main roster, you know, sooner rather than later. And as a guy like a solo Sokoa where, you know, that's never even a thought or a concern belting him up or something like that. It's really not with the NXT main title. But when it comes to... When it comes to the match, doesn't it, to me, it just seems like it has to be a violent blow off, a final way for Trick to get revenge and the NXT title would be, I don't want to say superfluous, but it's it's unneeded in the story. What do you think? Because I, again, I know people want to see Trick as the NXT champion. I do as well too, but that can be further down the line. To me, he just really needs to get all of his revenge on Mello. Based on the reaction that Trick got, weeks ago or a month ago when they were in Miami and he made the save for Mello, I would move him up to the main roster. I mean, he was over immediately to that crowd. Mello is the one who's been on SmackDown multiple times representing NXT, but Trick was the one that came out and got the huge ovation from the crowd. So as you said, I don't think that this story now needs the belt behind it because I think what they should do is have Trick defeat Mello strong in a brutal fight. Probably not going to be more brutal than whatever Ilya Dragunov cooks up, but have give these two all the bells and whistles, let them have a big blow-off match, and then move Trick and Mello up to the main roster after WrestleMania. I would love to see that. And technically, I mean, we've seen it happen a million times with it, whether it be Gargano and Ciampa or, you know, Owens and Zayn. You can do their team again and this breakup again on the main roster. And if you do it correctly, the people will buy in one more time to it. And the way that Trick Williams has gotten over in the last year or so, the organic reaction that was created and the groundswell that has come behind him, they are sitting in a good position right now when it comes to people up on the main roster. We'll be back, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, Filthy Tom Waller here with you. It's a Filthy Friday on Wrestling Observer Live. We don't know where Brian Alvarez is. We don't care where Brian Alvarez is, but we hopefully he's very happy and content wherever that may be. Tom, talking about Mark Kerr and the Smashing Machine and The Rock playing Mark Kerr in the in the upcoming movie that they're doing mark holman in the news this week a hero saving his parents life uh being hospitalized after that crazy situation where he was visiting his parents and woke up and saved them from a fire at their home a lot of people you know who are a lot younger just producer daniel earlier on you know you give it giving up on his age i mean it, it it feels like a lifetime ago that we were watching MMA 
from Japan. It feels like forever ago that the HBO documentary, The Smashing Machine, came out. And Mark Kerr in Mark Coleman, the movie's about Mark Kerr, but Mark Coleman plays such a huge part in that movie. Talk a little bit about I, I, Mark Coleman and... I don't want to say as an inspiration to you, but as somebody that came before you in this game when it was very young and came from a wrestling background and overcame jujitsu, but was one of those guys that started to break down the walls of the domination of jujitsu when it came to the UFC. Can you talk a little about Coleman and his influence and how big of a, of a personality and a force he was in this sport? Well, Mark Coleman, the ha- Mark the Hammer Coleman, was one of the prototypical wrestlers from the U.S. Who, I, I mean, if Mark Kerr wasn't going to have the nickname The Smashing Machine, it could have been Mark Coleman. But the Hammer fits him just as well. Out of the wrestlers that we saw, Dan Severn, Don Fry, the guys that preceded him, He was the best of them. He submitted Dan Severn with a headlock. The headlock you see in pro wrestling in every match. A headlock takeover finish on the ground. Mark Coleman submitted Dan Dan the Beast Severn with that. He beat up Don Fry badly. (laughs) This guy was a wrecking ball. He was a legit hammer during his time if headbutts were still allowed he'd still be the <laughs> ufc champion that was, was that was always that was always the the thing on the internet but uh he had a great like he had a downfall i guess you could say with a disputed fight i guess you could say against nobihiko takata where he lost via leg lock And a lot of people counted him out, but he made a huge comeback. He won the Pride Grand Prix, defeated Igor Vovchanchin with a bunch of knees, and really resurrected his career. Defeated Shogun Hua when Shogun Hua was at the top of his game. Now, albeit it was a injury, TKO injury victory, you know, Mark Coleman was one of the top fighters and one of the top personalities in MMA. And if you want to talk about the kind of influence this guy had, not only me, but other fighters, he also ventured into Hustle and IGF and did professional wrestling. And he and Kevin Randleman were one hell of a tag team when they were together and like Mark Coleman is a legend. It's unfortunate. I mean, clearly it's it's terrible, terrible what happened to him and his parents. Um, I hope. I I don't hope that I am put in this situation, but I hope one day I can prove myself to be as loyal and as good of a man as the Little Hammer was. R.I.P to the the real hero, the dog who woke up Mark Coleman and let him know what was going on. But I was very happy, as I'm sure a lot of people were, to see that guy wake up. He had the tubes in his nose. His voice sounds like he was in a house fire. (laughs) Yeah. But he said he's the luckiest man alive and, man, brought a tear to my eye. Still does every time I think about it. So best wishes to the hammer and we're going to see a smashing machine movie a movie about mark kerr but there better be a movie about mark coleman made sooner than later i would love to see it because you know he's the first ufc heavyweight champion technically uh, ever you know and left the ufc because of money because i believe that part of a contract dispute that ended up getting him out of there which you know a lot of people don't realize that I mean, what the 185-pound division with uh, Marilio Bustamante, and there were—it seemed to be Dave Manet, yeah, Dave Manet, and was, Gil Castillo. 
Well, they but the guys who ended up, you know, they would win the championships and then go over to Japan and fight because that's where the money was. Remember when Rich Franklin went over to take a fight in K1 because he was making $100,000 and he went over there and ended up getting knocked out. But he's like, you know, that's where the money was at the time. It's amazing how the way that times have changed so much and it was really off the backs of all these guys like the Goodriches and all these other guys who came through that you know we're able to have what we have today and is able to be you know to where, where we've gotten today has been absolutely amazing and it's you know kind of funny looking at where Japan is right now and the situation in Japan you know one time boxing was king here well now if you look at it the number one fighter in the world if you don't think that it's terence crawford is naoya uh, inoa in a way and it seems to be oh he's number one the yeah, little monster is the best boxer on this planet. He's an absolute killer. And now you look at, you know, you look at the situation that they're in with mixed martial arts and, you know, you look at it here and there's there's no even, there's nothing even close. And what did you think, though? I mean, <laughs> when you saw, because you talked about the controversial fight with Takata, what a lot of people don't, I mean, he took a vertical suplex from Takata. I mean, as soon as I saw that, I thought, you know, there are things that happen here in Pride and happen in Japan that eh, may not necessarily be on the level so much. What did you think about that? And again, he says, hey, he never admitted, to my knowledge, he never admitted that that fight was work. But he is very clear in saying, I had the opportunity to come back and they were going to continue to keep paying me if I came back. It reminds me of the great Bobby the Gr Brain Heenan quote of... We never said it was real. You just said it was fake. It's, you know, it's the perfect way to put it. The absolute perfect way to put it. No good way to transition back to American wrestling after that, but I'm going to have to here. Bailey and Dakota Kai. By the way, I think that's the only thing that's that's mentioned uh, otherwise for SmackDown tonight. We got a lot of matches that we're going to actually have to get together here at some point that I'm assuming are going to come to pass tonight. Jay and Jimmy Uso has got to officially be announced for the show. I have a feeling we're getting Bobby Lashley in the Street Profits against Karrion Cross in the AOP in a match on one of the two nights of WrestleMania, which takes them out of the tag team title shot picture where Dunn, Bate, you got Pretty Deadly, you have, I don't know, who do you have, Theory and Waller maybe? You know, I, I don't know how all that's going to go down. Plus, Jake Paul... Kevin Owens, Randy Orton, that situation. Are we getting a, in your mind, since you're our SmackDown expert, are we getting a U.S. title match between all three of those guys? Or do you think that this could, we could have a fourth person involved and it either turns into a tag team match between, say, the Pauls against Owens and Orton or something like that, or we get a multiple person U.S. title match? I'm leaning towards a, a three way between Paul Owens and Orton because they teased that dissension after the match last week where Orton almost hit him with the brass knuckles. And I think if you're not going to move in that direction, you just don't even do that whatsoever. And maybe, maybe this is the conspiracy theorist in me, but I feel like we might be getting some sort of swerve in the raw match as well with Gunther and getting Chad Gable who wasn't pinned added to that match wwe as we've seen in the past loves 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 on the two nights of wrestlemania to put forth shows that are essentially the same thing on different nights where you have we've had during the COVID era i think it was like one big title match was just all big moves one night the next night it was the same thing you'd have one stipulation match one night one woman's title match one night one the other so we may be getting two multi-mans in those title matches when I thought we were getting Randy Orton versus Logan Paul, even though it had been Logan Paul and Kevin Owens feuding forever. Uh, and Did maybe it's going to be the same Paul thing earlier? in Raw. Did I say Jake Paul earlier or Logan? I don't know what you said. What do you think about Jake Paul and Mike Tyson? <laughs> Everybody's what do you think talking. About the money that Netflix is, is obviously going to kick out for this. Netflix is in a big spending mood, aren't they? I've got Apparently. some ideas for them. <laughs> so uh, if they're well, look, if this to me, this is so pandemic era and stuck in a you know weird time. But 
you know, with that said, it's also, you want to talk about a draw back to the old days of mixed martial arts in Japan on New Year's Eve. You get Bobby Oligan fighting Akabono or whatever it would be. And that's what this, you know, feels like a little bit. Although, is I assume safely, I, I would think this is an exhibition, right? I mean, it, does, does anybody, because there seems to be the mainstream media who tends to be really, you know, out of step when it comes to talking about anything when it's related to boxing. I mean, I have a feeling that uh, a handful of them at least seem to think that this is going to be a real fight. I think we're going to get something more along the lines of Mike Tyson, Roy Jones Jr. Yeah. Than something along the lines of Logan Paul, Tommy Fury, or... Or, I mean, Jake Paul, excuse me, Jake Paul, Tommy Fury, or whatever, whatever bum cab driver tomato can he just fought. Uh, I think this is going to be an exhibition. If you remember, even against like Roy Jones Jr., Tyson pulled his foot off the gas a little bit. And people are talking yeah. about, oh, my God, he's fighting 50 something year old Mike Tyson. Well, Tyson fought a few years ago, and he was actually moving around pretty well from what I remember. Now, a lot can go south in years over time, but uh, he looked pretty good in these short clips on the mitts. And I, I don't think that Jake Paul is going to try to take his head off. I'm just wondering now, as I said that, I was very apprehensive <laughs> thinking about. Uh, you know, what could happen? Is he going in there trying to pull attention Nasakawa and he's going to go <laughs> after uh, Mike Tyson and get his head knocked off like tension did against Floyd Mayweather or uh, what's going to happen here? That was an amazing exhibition as well, too, because I'm sure Floyd was, would have been fine with taking that guy 12 rounds in the same way that he took Connor for however long that it was before he ended up, you know, you know, putting a, a period at the end of that, but Nishikawa going out there just getting completely wiped out. Uh, yeah, did, didn't end up being the best thing there. Probably should get in a couple of notes here on AEW. Swerve Strickland revealed last night he's going to be performing at the Rolling Loud Music Festival in California this weekend. It's become the biggest festival in all of hip-hop. And uh, he'll be performing on Sunday with Flash Garments as part of the DJ5 Venom's appearance at the festival. The Big Pressure remix by Flash Garments and Swerve is what Swerve uses as theme music. Uh, obviously... Tom, um, yeah, it's not exactly, you know, a solo performance at Hot 97 Summer Jam, but, you know, feather in, in Swerve's cap there, and obviously good attention that AEW could use to continue to pump this guy up as one of their biggest stars. We'll let you know what's going on with Rampage and Collision over the weekend, as well as Tom's thoughts on the New Japan Cup. Hopefully they're short, sweet, and mean. Wrestling Observer Live. For me, Filthy Tom Waller here with you. A big, messy edition of Wrestling Observer Live today, Filthy, which, you know, hey, perfect for your return to the program. Perfect. It's what I love. Throw me right in the muck. The muck, the mud, like AEW's ratings, right? That's what everybody, uh, the, the ones that hate, boy, are they bringing this up. Wednesday's Dynamite, 801,000 viewers on TBS, a 3% increase from last week. 18 to 49 demo remained the same at 0.27. This does not include the overrun of the show. You know, I know a lot of people are, you know, will want to jump on that number or anything, but you can't. You can't fix it all overnight. Consistency is incredibly important when it comes to AEW, but Okada, Osprey, Mercedes, you got Kyle O'Reilly back, you got Pac back. At some point, you're going to get MJF and Jamie Hayter back. So, you know, to me, if you do the right thing by Jay White, Takeshita, Samoa Joe, Willie Hobbs, you start, like, doing something with those guys and fix your tag division, which you're set up to do right now with this tournament that is supposed to be kicking off, you know, for what anybody says, they could be, they seem to be in a good position here for the rest of the year. But again, it's a lot of dotting I's and crossing T's with this company, Tom. Yeah, I think they're in a fine position. You know, the ratings, when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, the ratings are fine. They're doing good against what else is on television. And I think, like you said, they're set up for some big things. They've got one of the most stacked rosters that we've ever seen in the history of professional wrestling. Like, I wish I could have everybody 
that they have on that roster on the Fight Forever video game. It's a AEW and WWE's roster as well, too, with the NIL guys that are, for what anybody says about that program, and I was wondering how it was going to work when you're getting Obafemi and Bronco Nima and Lucian Price looking good, all the young people that they have and the other folks that they have with them, too. Right now, wrestling is in a very, very good position, unless you're really upset over the Continental Crown being broken apart, which I got to be on this topic real quick. What did you think? Hey, I'm not upset because maybe finally I'll get my return match for that New Japan Strong open white title. And if I don't, uh, heck, even if I do, I'll probably still be on these airwaves with you. Because this is what I love doing, Mike. Thanks for having me. Champions, we shall talk to you again after a while.